Our featured guest tonight is an animator and director whose work on some of the most iconic 2D animation films ever made has earned him a permanent place, in my mind, in the greatest animators of all time category. His directing credits, along with collaborator Kirk Wise, include nothing less than such incredible films as Beauty and the Beast, Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Atlantis, The Lost Empire. Here to chat about his incredible career is none other than director Gary Truesdale. Gary, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. So I I'm a little curious about life what life was like for you before Cal Arts? What was it like for you growing up in in California and before and how Cal did, Arts, guess, film and everything? Yes. Oh wow, um, <laughs> that, that was so long ago. I can hardly remember. Um, I mean, I've I've always I've always liked to draw. Um, you know, have have drawn since I was pretty much old enough to hold crayons. Um, and I was attracted to Disney just because they had great animation. Um, even at a young age, I could kind of tell the difference between, you know, like, okay, Rocky and Bowinkle was always really funny to me, but I could always tell the animation kind of sucked that it was, that it was hilariously written. Um, not, not that I, you know, as a six year old could understand that it was actually written, but that it was funny but it didn't. It just didn't look as good as something like, uh, as you know, Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, or or Sleeping Beauty, or um, even the Warner Brothers ones, which I was a big fan. Um, Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner, Porky Pig, Sylvester, you know that whole, the the whole uh, gang there, which that's really that was really my love of cartoons. You know, as, as much as I like Disney and seeing, oh wow, there's you know they they're so meticulous in in their uh, in their animation. It was the humor and the character in uh, um, the, the old Warner Brothers stuff, the Foghorn Leghorn, and you know all of those. Also, um, my dad was was a fan, particularly of, of uh, Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote, um, and that was my get out of jail free card on Saturday mornings. Because instead of having to go out and rake leaves or mow the lawn or something like that, Dad would be sitting in front of the, the TV. And I, okay, I'm 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 there with you. So you get to spend time with dad and get out and of the cartoons kind of and not mow the lawn. I mean, yeah, it was the, the, the hat trick right there. Um, Were your parents or grandparents artistic in any way? My mom was. My mom was craftsy. You know, I mean, she she could draw and she could paint, um, but she liked making things. She liked working with her hands. My, my grandmother was a seamstress. Um, my dad was an athlete. You know, I mean, he he. Um, he lied about his age to get into the army and uh um after a stint in the artillery where he lost his hearing uh or uh, you know the high end of his hearing he um um he got into special services which in in the army is like the band or you know something like so he was a, he was an athlete he was in the army the army uh track team football team basketball team so um yeah, he wasn't he wasn't particularly artistic. He was very organized and, you know, and very athletic, but uh it was my mom that had that gene, I suppose. You chose a really interesting time to study animation with technology and movie making changing in major ways at the time. What made you choose animation and could you at all foresee the advent of 3D animation and the end of 2D on the horizon while you were actually studying? Well, when I was um um I, I guess when I was in high school, um, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't really consider animation as a, you know, as, as a viable career. I did. It didn't occur to me that you could do that and make a living. Um, I wanted to be an architect, you know, and so I, I was studying drafting and, and mechanical drawing and, you know, all, the, all that stuff. And um, then I started failing math in a spectacular fashion um, and thought, OK, I got to figure out something to do. And. My high school had a had a career day where they had different people from all walks of life come in and talk to students. And, you know, there were firemen and pilots and nurses and, you know, all all these different people. And one of them was was an animation student from CalArts, you know, which wow, CalArts, never heard of it. <clears throat> so I had I had already figured out, and I thought I was a genius for this, like in the fourth grade, that if you take a, a pad of paper and draw on the different pages and flip, flip through it, 
it would move. I thought, I've discovered, you know, sliced bread. Um, so so this, this woman from Cal Arts had us doing stuff like that and like drawing with Sharpie on blank um, film leader. And, and then she ran it through a projector and there was like maybe eight or nine people in that little seminar. But the, the, the real takeaway was Cal Arts is an animation school just out in Valencia, which was like, you know, 45 minutes from me. So I thought, I got to check this out. You know, went and looked at it and applied and you needed a, a you needed a portfolio, which I didn't even have a portfolio. I didn't even know what one was. And uh, I, a, a, a buddy of mine in, in school, his mom was a painter. She did like landscape and, and still life and portrait and all that. And closest thing I knew to an artist. So I, I asked her about, what's a portfolio and she helped me put one together applied was accepted and at that time animation was it it wasn't as widespread as it is now i mean it was there was certainly some animation coming out of out of like spain and italy and and uh um i believe was czechoslovakia at that time um and then certainly uh coming out of japan and a little bit out of korea but um and the aforementioned Rocky and Bowinkle was coming out of Mexico. So, um, you know, it was around, but like the U S animation industry wasn't huge. So it, basically it was Disney and Warner brothers had already kind of closed down. It was filmation and Hanna-Barbera and a, a few other smaller, well, not small at that time, a few other places. And then, and then the smaller commercial houses, you know, because there was, there was still a lot of hand-drawn animation being done for, Exxon and Levi's and, you know, all, all these different uh, corporations, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but nothing digital yet. You know, when I got into, when I finally got into uh, Disney, um, I got in on the, um, the effects team on the black cauldron in 1983, I believe. And um, they were just, just, just starting um, to, to monkey around with, with digital. And at that time, they didn't even call it digital. I mean, they were they were printing out wireframe thing on you know wireframe structures on pieces of paper and then giving it to the uh, assistants to like draw over it you know in a clean animation cartoon line. Um, I know this because I did some of those. Um, the uh, there was like a, a particular rowboat that was moving around on the water and you know the perspective was changing and the lines of the planks were changing. And those were all plotted out in real sketchy uh, wireframe and then given to the assistants. That was us. And then we drew over it, you know, in the smooth line and put the wood grain in and, you know, handed that off to the painters. Um, so that was that was the extent of digital back then. And, and people really weren't that worried about it. You know, it wasn't until I don't think it was until John Lasseter, you know, put together um you know, some of his little shorts, uh, Luxo and Tin Toy and, you know, th- those that people started to really like perk up and go, hey, this is this is something. And, you know, and that was that was a few years. That was a few years down the line still. So now it was at Cal Arts that I guess as fate would have it, you met your future collaborator, Kirk Wise. Was, what was your very first memory of Kirk? Kirk was in I think he was two years behind me. Um and I mean, I, he was he was one of these guys that he stood out a little bit from the rest of the group. And these groups are all um, I, I've, I've heard this term, um, you know, for for like actors as well. It was a box of puppies. You know, everybody wants to be th- yeah. the most adorable and, and the, mo- the most on. And and, you know, all of the classes are like that to one degree or another. And his class was like that as well. But Kirk kind of stood out because he was like you could tell there was like something going on inside. It wasn't just like, I want to, you know, I want to be the craziest. It was, he had, um, he had a real funny streak to him, but it was a kind of a thoughtful, funny streak. And he was really quick. He was really fast. And, you know, I've said that ever since it's like, well, Kirk's the smart one and I'm the funny looking one. So that he, he's, if you want a good sound bite, talk to Kirk. And could you in any way sense a, a brotherhood or kindred spirit with him in your initial conversations with him? Or did that come later? That came later. Yeah. I mean, it, he was, there, there was a lot of people that, you know, and we all hung out and we all had fun and we all, you know, we were all kind of hoping, kind of, you know, we're going to work together someday. And 
Kirk and Chris Sanders and Chris Bailey and Kelly Asbury and Kevin Lima and, you know, just all these different people that were, they were kind of going through at the same time and all in this big stew, Joe Ramp, Kathy Zielinski, you know, all, all Dave Prexma, all these people. And it, it was uh, this crazy mix of personalities and talent. And, you know, it was, it was really great. So picking out one at that time was, was a little, was a little tough. There were like Joe Ramp. I knew he was something, you know, he was something special. He, he was, there was, there was something about Joe, but, um, but he was older than me as well. So it's, it's that experience thing that I looked up to. 